the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Let's stand to our feet and let's go before the Lord together in prayer today. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that we can freely come into a house of God like we have today to worship you, to honor you, to lift up our hands and our voices to you. And God, we thank you that we can do that freely in this nation. God, we thank you for those that have given the ultimate sacrifice of their lives. Lord, they have laid down their lives for their friends, God, just as our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we give you honor and praise and thanks for them, God, that we can come into the house of God, have the word of God in our lap, that we can sing and openly lift our hands and worship you. God, we pray that you comfort those that are mourning the loss of loved ones, God. We remember them, God, and we pray that you be near to them, God, and we give you praise and thanks for their sacrifice as well. God, today as we approach your word, we pray that you would open it up to us. Give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown today. Truly today, Lord, we do not come into the house of God to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, from the black, the white, the brown, or any other color, God. We come to hear from you. Holy Spirit, come and be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us the guidance, the direction, the vision, and the wisdom that each and every one of us need for our individual lives. And God, we praise you and we thank you for that. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherever they're at, Lord, we pray that you bless them, God, as they meet today in the house of God all over the world. God, we thank you, Lord, that you bless them as you would bless us this day. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. And we say, Amen. Amen. You can have a seat today. Get your Bibles out. Go with me to the book of 2 Corinthians. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter number 9 today. And while you're turning there to 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, the title of today's message is Supply and Multiply. Supply and Multiply. We're going to be taking a look at a couple of verses in 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter. And while you're turning there, let me give you a little bit of background on this. The Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. This is his second letter, actually third letter. There was another letter that we don't have, but uh, here he is. He's talking to them about something that took place about a year ago. They had made a commitment to send relief to the believers in Jerusalem and in Judea. The church there was suffering and they had needs, and so believers from all over the known world at that time had gathered collections and had offered assistance for the saints there in Jerusalem and in Judea. And so here the Apostle Paul writes to them, and he's telling them about this offering. He's reminding them that, hey, a year ago, guy, a year ago guys, you made a commitment, and you were ready to give at that time, and yet now I'm coming to you, and I'm going to receive that offering, and so I want you to be ready. I don't want to be embarrassed when I come. I've got people with me, and I've been bragging on you guys, talking about your generous hearts, and now when I come, I, want, I don't want to have people scrambling, making collections. No, set it aside as you prosper. That way, when I come, there be no collections. No, you can just give, and we can all rejoice together. And even, he uses a little bit of friendly competition. You know, the Greeks and the Romans, you know, they had a little bit of competition in the natural. And so he says, hey, the, the Macedonian church, the Greek church, they've already given. And so now it's your turn. And so, you know, not to be bettered by anybody else, here's the church at Corinth, and they're saying, we're going to give, and we're going to be a part of this ministry. And here we pick up in 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verse number 10, and verse number 11, 2 Corinthians 9 chapter, verse number 10 and verse number 11. 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, verse 10 says this, Now may he, capital A speaking of God, may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply. Everybody say supply and multiply. Okay, that was weak. That's all right. Listen, you didn't come to church today to spectate. You came to participate, all right? We're not going to allow you just to fall asleep out there. This is, this is your time. You're going to get something out of this today. So I want everybody, come on, everybody say supply and multiply. Supply and multiply. There you are. Praise God. And multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Verse number 11, while you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us. To God. Now, today, as we go through the message, I'm going to be pulling out some thoughts, pulling out some things that I see from the Word of God and my time with God that God gave me to give to you. Now, from those type A personalities who you like a nice outline, you want the heading, you want point number one, point number two, point number three, it's not going to be so neat and clean today. It'll be a little bit messy, a little bit scattered, a little bit random. That's okay. Listen, we're all going to get something out of the Word of the Lord today. I will still have things for you to write down some notes, so just hang on. We're all going to get something out of the Word of the Lord today. First thought for us today as we approach the Word of God, 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, verse number 10 says this, Now may he who supplies seed... To the sower. Stop right there and look up at me. 
He who supplies seed to the sower. That means that we have to be sowers first. Then God provides the seed. First thought for us today is that we have to be sowers first. Then God provides the seed. Now, to us in the natural, this makes no sense. We take a look at that and we say, I can't be a sower. I don't have anything. And how could I be a sower without any seed? I need to have the seed first, and I need to actually cast it out there on the ground, and then you can call me a sower. Now, in the natural, we understand this. Even the IRS will tell you that you are not anything until you have made money off of that thing. For instance, I could be a master painter. I could be somebody who could paint photorealism paintings. Now, what is that? That's where you can paint so good that it looks like somebody took a photograph. I could be that good. I could have thousands of paintings that I've done, and if I have not made a dollar yet, the IRS will not say that I'm an artist. They will say, no, you, you're somebody who has a hobby, that's fine for you, but you are not an artist. Now, the moment I take one of those paintings and I sell it to somebody and make a buck off of it, now all of a sudden the IRS comes in and says, okay, you are now taxable on that income, but you can write off all of your art supplies all the way back to the very first little crayon and piece of paper you ever bought, and now that's a part of your write-offs, that's a part of your business, and now, now that you've sold something, you are an artist. But until you sell something, no, it's just a hobby. But see, God is quite the opposite than the world. Oftentimes we find these things with God. There's great comparisons and great contrasting between the the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world. And so we see that in God's system, that God says, no, you don't have to have seed and sow seed in order to be a sower. No, you have to be a sower first, and then I will provide to you the seed. And in our natural thinking, we go, how does that work? What, what, what's going on? Well, remember that our God is a God who calls those things that be not as if they were. Our God is a God who thought of it, conceived the notion, spoke the planets into existence, stretched out the solar systems, spun the world in its orbit around the sun, holds everything together, how? By the power of his word. And so we need to line up with the way of God, and we need to start declaring the word of God and say, you know what? I may not have anything. I might not have anything to show, but listen, I I am a sower. I am what God says I am. I will do what God says I will do and stand and declare the word of God. And all of a sudden, God says, ah, I see a sower and I'm going to provide them with seed. Are you listening today? We see this in 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. You're there in 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. Turn a page back to 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, verse number 12. Take a look at this. It says, for if there is first, everybody say first. If there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what he does not have. See, we could say, well, I don't have any seed. I don't have anything. I don't have any money. I hear that all the time. I don't have money. I can't give anything, right? And God says it's not according to what you have, right? What you do not have, it's according to what you do have. Do you have a willing mind? Are you in there saying, I want to give? I I I desire to be a sower, If so, then God says, I see that desire, that's acceptable, not according to what you have, right? Not according to what you have and not according to what you do not have. So God says, start with the heart. Start right where you're at. Start to declare, I am a sower. I can give. God is going to supply me with something. I can be what God has said I can be. I can do what God has said I can do. And you start with the heart. In fact, that willing mind there, we think of that as as our mental capacity. There has to be a willing mind. Listen, it goes beyond that. If you look up the original word in the original language, it's not talking about your mind. It's talking about a passionate desire. This is something that burns on the inside of you. This is something you are yearning for. God, I so want to give. God, I have a desire. God, I have a passion. I want to help others. God, I want to support the church. God, I want to do something. I want to be a sower, God. And then God sees that heart and says, ah, now I can bless you. God, God supplies seed to the sower. Are you listening today? I remember uh, we had a missionary here at the church. Her name was Marilyn Skinner. Marilyn Skinner came from Uganda, Africa. She was Canadian. Her and her husband, Gary, moved to Uganda, and they started orphanages. And and they're out there helping babies that are are AIDS babies, pairing up moms with babies, doing a great work there in, in Uganda, Africa. And she came here, and she preached a sermon, and she gave a call, and she said, unless the American churches start to get on board with missions and start to help, we cannot fulfill the plan of God out there because we can't make the money. We need people to sow, and we need your help. And so she gave this plea, and I remember Pastor Jim, with tears in his eyes, was pierced in the heart, came up here, and he said, you know what, I refuse to pastor a church that doesn't have a heart. We're going to sow. We're going to give. We're going we're gonna to do something. And he said, you know what? I'm going to sell my boat. 
and give the money to the missions. Now, the boat was a supernatural thing. It came into his hands free and clear. That's a story all in itself. But the pastor said, you know what? I'm going to sacrifice that. I'm going to give. I have a willing heart and a willing mind. And here I am. I'm going to do something with that. And he said, listen, you all are going to do something too. Because I refuse to pastor a church that doesn't have a heart. Now, myself there on the front row, I said, you know what? I can't stand idly by. You know what? This is my church. This is my house. These are Christians. These are people. These are widows and orphans. And I need to do something too. And God, I have a willing heart. I have a willing mind. What can I do? God brought to my remembrance, God brought to my mind that I have several guitars in my possession. And these several guitars, I love playing guitar, love to play music and that sort of a thing. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to sell one of my guitars. And the Lord said, yes, you are. You're going to sell this guitar. And I thought about it, and it was my first guitar. Now, when I was young, I, I grew up, and, and my dad was a guitarist and, and played music, so my dad taught me how to play guitar, and I, I had learned and studied and, you know, did that thing for a long time and had really learned how to play the guitar, and I got good at playing guitar. And so my parents, when I had learned how to play guitar, they came to me, and they went out to the music shop, and they bought me my first guitar, and they said, son, because you learned how to play, here's a guitar. This is all your own. Here you go. And I was just amazed at that. It was a beautiful white kind of cream-colored guitar. Had a rosewood fretboard. It was a Fender Stratocaster. And, and it was just a beautiful guitar. Played really nice. And on the back of that guitar, on the, on the little plate that held the neck to the body, it had the Wayne's World logo. You guys remember Wayne's World? Party time, excellent, you know. And Wayne would always go into the music shop, and he would stare at the guitar up there. Oh! You know, and he wanted that guitar. Well, here was the Wayne's World replica guitar that my parents got for me for learning how to play. And so God said, I want you to sell that guitar. Now, this had value to me. And, of course, my heart was attached to it because the sentimental value, all that kind of stuff, I'd learned to play. I got it. You know, my parents and all that kind of stuff. But I said, you know what, Lord? It's worth it. God, it's worth the investment. I wanted to give. I wanted to show. This is what I have. And so, God, therefore, I'm going to step out. I'm going to believe you, God, and I'm going to give the money that I make off this guitar to the widows and orphans there in Uganda. And so I went down to Guitar Center right over here. And as I went into Guitar Center, I'm thinking, you know what, okay, uh, my goodness, this thing's probably worth thousands. You know, it's the Wayne's World replica and, and that sort of thing. But you know what, I know it's got some scratches on it, a little bit of love. It was kind of dirty, you know, and had my fingerprints on it and stuff. And, and it was missing the little nut that held the, the jack in place there for when you plugged in your guitar and had some scratches on the back for my belt buckle and things from playing. And so, you know, it had, it had a bit of love on it. So I said, okay, so they'll probably knock a couple hundred bucks off, maybe get five, six hundred bucks. So I go there into the Guitar Center, I approach the sales manager, I said, now, listen, I'd like to sell this guitar. He looks at it, he says, okay, cool, you know, let me check it out, let me see. And I said, it's got the, the Wayne's World logo on it. This is the replica of the one in the movie, so it's, you know, probably worth a little bit more. He's, oh, okay, okay, let me check it out. So he goes online, he says, I haven't really seen that. Goes online, starts checking it out, he says, well, you know, some sold in Canada for about 220 bucks, you know, something like that. I'll give you 200 for it. I'm sorry, excuse me, two, 200? You, you'll give me, two, list, okay, all right. So I sold my guitar for $200. I said, okay, God, that's what I have. God, I have a willing heart. God, now you've placed seed in my hand. See, he who supplies seed to the sower, I took that, I brought it here to the church, and I sowed it, I gave that money, and we sent it off to Uganda to take care of widows and orphans. And very interestingly enough, I got before the church, was preaching a sermon, and told everybody that I had sacrificed, I'd given up my first guitar. And lo and behold, I'm sitting in my office, you know, a couple years later, I'm sitting in my office, and uh, all of a sudden, I get a phone call that says, Pastor, um, there's somebody left a, a, a box up here for you. I'm thinking, oh, okay, who was it? And he said, no, it's anonymous. Okay, so I go up to the front desk, and there wasn't just a box. It was a large case, large black case. And I'm thinking, what is this, you know? And so I, I open it up there, and I pull it open, and there inside of this black case is a beautiful carven guitar. I, and for those of you, you probably don't know what Carvin is. Carvin is a guitar manufacturer that you don't just go and pick out what guitar you want. No, you custom build your guitar. Okay, so it had beautiful wood. It had all the bells and whistles. It had several different types of pickups. It was acoustic and electric. It was just beautiful. Most guitarists would drool over it, even though some of you guys have glazed over. And they, they know what it means, and so they're going, oh, yeah, man, that's probably a great guitar. And so I was like, wow, that's amazing. If you were to buy that guitar today... It would be $2,000 to buy that guitar. Remember, I sold my guitar for $200. Now God has placed in my hands a 
$1,000 guitar. Now listen, I am not here today to tell you, sow your seed of $10 and God will give you $100. And if you sow your seed of $100, God will give you $1,000. That's not what this is about. What this is about is that God supplies seed to the sower. And here's the second thought for today. The second thought for today is that the generous heart will be given an increasing means to give. See, I had sown one thing of a certain value, and now God had given me back something of greater value. Now, I don't know of any farmer in the natural that sows one seed and expects one seed back. No, they sow one seed, and they expect a harvest back, whether that means 10 seeds, 50 seeds, thousands of seeds. In any event, what they're doing is they're sowing one to reap a harvest. In the same way as we sow our seed, that generous heart, wherever we start, that willing heart, and we say, God, I want to be a giver, and then God supplies seed to the sower. Now, all of a sudden, you start to sow. The generous heart will be given an increasing means to give. I took that same carbon guitar, and there was a young worship leader in our church that I said, you know what, you, you want to learn how to play guitar? And they said, yeah, but I don't have a guitar. I said, here is a guitar for you to learn on. And I sowed that seed once again. See, God will give you, as you start to be generous, an increasing measure to give. John Bunyan said in Pilgrim's Progress, a man there was, so some did count him mad. The more he cast away, the more he had. We see examples of this all throughout the Bible. I wish we had time today, you know, like a couple of six hours or something like that, just to go through all the examples in the Bible. But listen, you'll have to do that on your own. But listen, you, you, you remember the parable of the sower, right? Talking about sowing seed. Think about it. Every seed produced something. In fact, in the book of Genesis, God says that every seed has the power within it to produce after its own kind. That means that any seed that you sow has the power in itself to produce something. The only time it doesn't produce is if there's something wrong with the heart. Nothing wrong with the seed. Something wrong with the heart. The parable of the sower, the only seed that didn't produce was the seed that was stolen away by the devil, right? The birds of the air came and, and snatched up that seed that was sown by the wayside. All of the other seed produced something. You remember the seed on, on stony ground? It produced, right? A little plant sprouted up. Now, it didn't have any root within itself. Persecution for the word's sake arose like the sun, and it was burned up. The, the seed that was sown among thorns, it produced, right? And yet it was choked out by the thorns, the cares of this life and the desire for other things. Now, the seed sown on good ground, talking about the heart. Seed that was sown on good ground not only made a plant, but it also produced fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold, based on the type of seed. Are you listening today? Only way that it's not going to produce is if it gets stolen out of your heart. So our job is to keep our hearts right, to have that willing heart, to have that generous heart, and to sow that seed, and then it will produce something. How about another example we see in the Word, the, the parable of the talents. Here's some guys, master delivers his goods to them. There's three guys, two of them go out, right? The one who had five, he goes out, he starts to buy and sell and trade. He comes back with five more. Second guy looks at him and says, I could do that. So he goes out and he buys and sells, he trades, he comes back, and he had two more. Now the last guy, he went because he was afraid, and he buried that talent in the ground, and then when it came time for the master to come, he took it up out of the ground and handed it back to the master and said, see here, you have what is yours. I didn't do anything with it because I, I was afraid of you. I knew you reap where you had not sown, and you gather where you had not scattered. And what does the master do? Does the master say thank you? No, he says, you wicked and lazy servants. Now we think, you got back what you had. Why are you calling them wicked and lazy? Wicked. What is that? Contrary to the ways of God. God says he wants us to sow. God says he wants us to be generous. God says he wants us to be diligent. And so he says, you're wicked. You're contrary to my ways. And not only that, you're lazy. You didn't want to go out there and work. You didn't want to go after it. You didn't want to do something with it. And he says, you knew this about me. You should have at least given it to the bankers so that I could have had my money back with interest. What did he do? He just gave him a plan that he could have made more money. Think about it this way. If that guy with one talent, when he received the talent, said, Master, you know what? I'm really afraid of you. And, and I know that you, you, you reap where you do not sow and you gather where you have not scattered. And I'm really kind of dumb. And I don't really have business sense. I can't buy and sell and trade like these guys. What should I do? And the master could have told him, well, just go take it to the bankers and at least I'll get it back with interest. See, then he would have been commended. Why? Because he followed the master's plan and because he brought increase to the master. But the only reason he did not produce is because of what? His heart. An evil heart 
of unbelief. It was a wicked heart contrary to the ways of God, and he was lazy and didn't want to do anything with it. Are you listening today? Galatians chapter 6. You're there in 2 Corinthians. Turn with me to the book of Galatians. One book over. Chapter number 6. Galatians chapter 6. We're going to take a look at verse number 9. Galatians chapter 6, verse number 9 says this. It says, And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall, what? Reap. Reap. We shall reap if, biggest little word in the Bible, if we do not lose heart. In other words, can I put it to you like this? We can't lose. You can't lose. If you sow, it's going to grow. We can't lose unless we lose heart. See, there's no problem with the seed. You've got to cultivate the ground, make sure that it's all right. Why? Because it's all about the heart. God is looking at your heart, and the generous heart will be given an increasing means to give. And so we can't lose. If we sow, then we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Now, it's getting quiet in this place. Oh, we're listening, Pastor. We're listening. Okay, okay, okay. I got you. I got you. Well, that brings us to the next thing. We shall reap if we do not lose heart. So the next thing for us today is this. It will never be a good time to sow in the natural. Come on, can anybody give a witness to this? It's never going to be a good time to sow. There's always going to be a need. There's always going to be a bill. There's always going to be tremblings. There's always going to be shakings. There's always going to be stuff going on on the earth. There's always going to be some sort of a, a lack or a recession or a depression or something. There's always going to be pink slips being handed out. There's always going to be the house is losing its value. There's always going to be something that took place that you didn't think of, that you didn't plan for, an unexpected bill or a baby or something came along, and it's never going to be a good time to sow in the natural you know, my wife and I, we were thinking about this, and in our lives, it's never been a good time, right? We were going to get married. You're 21 years old. You're going to get married. You're too young to get married. Not a good time. So we decided, you know what? Hey, we're ready. We believe that God has called us to this, and we believe God's called us to love one another. We're going to get married. So here we are getting ready to get married. I lose my job. Oh, my goodness. What are we going to do now? We believe God. We continued to tithe. We continued to sow. God took care of us, got me a job, got us into Bible college. We got through Bible college. We come back. We want to buy a house. Not a good time to buy a house. You don't have any money. You haven't saved up anything. You need to wait. And so we said, okay, well, you know what? We're going to look. We believe that God is calling us to this. And we looked. And even without a down payment, we were able to get into a house. Now, that's not something that I'm telling you to go out and do today, okay? So Pastor Dan told me to go buy a house with no money. No, listen, listen, listen. Follow the will and the way of God for your life. That was just for us, Okay. Starting a family, not a good time to start a family. You guys are young. You need to get into your careers. You need to get into a groove. You guys, you know what? You don't want to raise children in this economy. You don't want to raise children in this world. I mean, the world is just getting darker and darker. It's getting more and more evil. The days are evil, and, and Jesus could be coming back. Do you want to raise kids in the tribulation that's coming on the earth? See, it's never a good time in the natural to sow. And if we look around at our circumstances, we won't do anything. In fact, the Bible talks about this. Take a look at it with me in the book of Ecclesiastes. Turn to the Old Testament with me now. If you find the Psalms and the Proverbs, right after Proverbs, you'll find the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter number 11, kind of towards the end of the book. Ecclesiastes chapter number 11, we're going to take a look at one verse, verse number 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse number 4 says this says, he who observes the wind will not sow. And he who regards the clouds will not reap. See, in other words, if you start to look at the circumstances around you, you're not going to sow. You're going to hold on to it and say, no, oh, oh, it's not a good time. It's hot out there. I'll be sweaty. I just took a shower. Uh, you know what, my fingers, they're going to be hurting, they're going to be aching, they, they might crack, I might get calluses, my, my hands might bleed a little bit, because you know what, that soil is really hard out there, and, and the plow, might, might, I might get a splinter, you know what, and not, not, I'll do it later, you know what, I'll go find some gloves first, and then I'll go, and I'll plow up the ground, then I'll scatter seed. Oh, you know what, it, it, it doesn't look like it's going to let up, it doesn't look like there's going to be any rain on the horizon, uh, I don't think, maybe I should wait until the rain's going to come, and maybe I should, maybe I should sow then. 
Uh, you know what? Oh, my goodness. And even if you do so, let's say you did start to scatter seed. You did start to sow. You saw clouds on the horizon. You said, rain, okay, I'm going to go scatter seed. But then you get inside the house and you look out and you say, man, those clouds are dark. Oh, my goodness. It looks like it's going to be a big one out there. I better not go out there. Yeah, the plants, I, I can see some fruit on the plants, but you know what? It just looks cold and dark. I, I may not want to go out there during the, it could be dangerous for me. Uh, I, I need to look out for myself. See, he who considers the wind will not sow. He who regards the clouds will not reap. we got to make sure that we're not looking at the circumstances around us, but that we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Keep our eyes fixed on God. That's why the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Why? Because if you start to look around at, at the things around you, you will start to falter and you will start to fail. That's why Peter, when he was walking on the water and he had his eyes on Jesus, was able to stay up. But the moment he looked at the wind and the waves, what happened? He started to sink, right? Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Jesus will catch you. Never going to be a good time to sow, but that brings us to the next thought for today. So anyways. So anyways. So anyways. So what? Well, so your time, so your attention, so your interest. So what? So your money, so your commitments, so into the people around you. So what? So into your family, so into your work, so into the community. So anywhere you can. It's never going to be a good time to give, but so anyways. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and start to do the works that he did. And so anyways. You're there in Ecclesiastes chapter 11. We were at verse 4. Drop down two verses. Verse number 6. Look at this. In the morning, sow your seed. And in the evening, do not withhold your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. What is that saying to us? Sow anywhere you can. Sow everywhere you can. Sow in, listen, sow in your tithes and your offerings, yeah, but also sow into people around you. Sow into missions. Sow into the Freedom for Our Future campaign. Sow into the people at work. My goodness, buy someone a cup of coffee and tell them, hey, Jesus loves you, and that's why you got that coffee right there is because Jesus loves you. And guess what? I love you too. All right, peace, right? <laughs> sow into them. You don't know what's going to prosper. You don't know where the return is going to come from. And listen, you don't know if it's going to come from everywhere. Why? Because the seed has power in itself to produce. And God is the God who provides seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Now, what does that mean to our lives? It means that oftentimes we'll say, but if I, if I sow, I won't have. If I give this seed, then what am I going to do to eat? I, I, I still need to feed my family. I need to feed myself. I need to take care of my own needs. And if I, if I sow this, I won't have anything else. But God says, I'll provide seed to the sower and bread for food. And bread for food. That means that as you sow your seed, that God will take care of your natural needs as well. If you eat your seed, then there's no return coming. There's no harvest. God will still take care of you. God will provide for you. But you're never going to have the harvest that you could have had if you would have sown. See, the natural conditions may say, no, hold on to it. Don't do anything with it. Eat it. Take care of your own needs. You need that. Oh, you better pay bills first. You better do this first. You better take care of your home first. And yet God says, let me be first. Keep your eyes fixed on me. Sow your seed. Sow it in the morning. Sow it in the evening. You don't know which one's going to prosper. But listen, God is the God of increase. God is the God of blessing. God is the one who calls those things that be not as if they were. God is the one who designed the seed. And as you sow your seed, it will grow. It will increase. And God will provide your food. He'll take care of your needs in the meantime. God is good. When God supplies and multiplies, he enlarges the harvest. You guys want to hear another story? We love stories, don't we? Want to hear about the best, most thoughtful gift I ever received? This past Christmas, I got the most thoughtful gift I have ever received in my entire life. I have a friend. He's a good friend, dear friend. A really a gift from God to myself and my wife and uh, just, just a really neat guy. And, and he's the type of guy, i got to tell you about him, he's the type of guy that you don't want to get a gift from because it makes you feel bad. You're like, here, I got you this gift card. You know, and he's like, oh, and I, I made a, a model clay image of you out of painstaking hours. And, you know, you're just like, are you kidding me? You're ridiculous. Just, uh, I'm just going to go away and cry, you know. So anyways... I, I think about it this way. We were over at his house. A bunch of us were over there at, at 4th of July, and he had bought those lanterns that you light the bottom of the lantern, and it floats up into the sky, and he put on the music from the movie Tangled. 
while we lit them and let them fly off into the sky. And at last I see the light. <laughs> we're all standing around like, who is this guy? You know, he's got this little smile on his face. And we're just like, are you kidding me? Well, on, on my wife and I first year anniversary, he came in with a DVD player. They didn't have any money. And we're like, what are you doing? You don't have to do that. Then when we bought our first home, he comes in with the barbecue. You know, he's like, hey, you need a barbecue. And we're like, what? come on, man. What are you, we bought you a plant when you got in your house. Get, get out of here. <laughs> so here we are at Christmas. And, and uh, you know, every year we say, no gifts for the adults. This is just for the kids, you know. And we always end up buying each other gifts anyways. And so this year, we, we were really strict. We laid it on thick. Listen. This year, money's tight. We just can't afford to do it. You know, families are expanding. No gifts, no gifts, no gifts. We laid it on thick. Now, for my wife and I, we noticed finance getting tight. And anytime that starts happening, we don't just look at the natural. We also look at the spiritual. And we realize the devil is trying to mess around. So he said, you know what? Uh Uh-uh. We're going to kick the teeth of the devil in. We're going to go out there. We're going to be generous. We're going to sow some seed. And so we went out and we bought a bunch of gifts for everybody. And we said, we're just going to sow into our family. We're not going to live a small life. We're going to live a generous life. Believe God. God's going to take care of our needs. So we go out there and we buy all these gifts. We get some gifts for our friends. So here they are in our house. We're sitting down at Christmas and the kids have opened their gifts. And my wife and I are smiling because we know we got them a gift, right? And so they, they're sitting there and we said, hey, um, one more thing. You know, now that the kids have opened their gifts, we got, we got something for you. And we gave them our gift. And they opened up. Oh, and they're so happy, so thankful and he gets this little smile on his face. And he says, well, since you guys did that, um, we have something to tell you. Too. We got you guys something too. So he runs out to the car, comes back in, and he, and he has this box and it's for my wife, and she opens it up, and we're like, oh, that's so, so thoughtful. Thank you, you know, and just, just a blessing. And he goes, okay, I got one more for you. And I said, no, 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 that's, that's my gift. Me and, me and, me and Jess, that's, that's for us, we're good. He goes, oh, no, 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 you got to have this one. Runs out to his car, comes back in with a big old box. I, I'm not kidding, big old box. And I'm thinking, what, is my grill getting old that now you have to give me another barbecue here? What's going on? So he slams down this box in front of me, and I'm just staring at the box like, what on earth could this be? And he's got that smile, the same one that he had when we were doing the Tangled song and the, you know, <laughs> he's got that smile on his face. And I'm thinking, something's jiving here. I don't know what's going on. And so I, I he's, open it, open it, open it. So I, you know, tear off the paper and I start to open it up. And inside of there, I, I realized that the box actually was cut open in the back because what was inside was too big for the box. And it's this long black case. And I pull this long black case out and I set it down and I unclick the front of it and I open it up. And inside, there's a creamy white fender Stratocaster, guitar, rosewood fretboard. And I'm thinking, my goodness, that looks a lot like my first guitar. And then as I'm looking at it, I'm staring at the guitar, and I realize, why would he buy me a dirty guitar? (laughs) It's got fingerprints all over it and smudges, and it's missing the little nut that holds the jack. So I grab the guitar and I lift it up and look on the back and there is the Wayne's World logo (laughs) on the back. You want to see my face? They took a picture of me, put it up on the overheads. this, This is the face of disbelief right there. Are you kidding me? My goodness, I'm just standing there in disbelief like that's, that's my, gu- this is my first guitar. How did you get my first guitar? I sold it. And he said, you know what, I was so excited that I called guitar and I said, you guys hold on to that guitar for me. I want it. He said, I raced down there. I was there 10 minutes before the doors opened because I thought everybody was going to buy it for you. <laughs> None of you guys got it. He bought the guitar. He didn't have the money to do it at that time. But he bought it, paid it off, and sat on it for five years. Kept it in his closet in his office. I I stood feet away from my guitar for five years. You know what else? He'd bring it up. Hey, remember that time you sold your guitar? (laughs) Sucker. What's the point of the story? 
point of the story is, is that generosity, God will supply seed to the sower. I had sown $200 guitar, received a $2,000 guitar, sowed that $2,000 guitar, received back a guitar that was priceless to me. How about for my friend? My friend had sown his time, his effort, his attention, his interest, and he has reaped. I mean, this guy is so blessed. It's unreal how God is prospering this man. But listen, what it does for all of us is it causes thanksgiving to God. Everybody say, thank God. Thank God. See, that's the last thought for today is thank God. Because as you sow your seed and God provides for your need, now all of a sudden it just doesn't give you and it doesn't just amass wealth here. No, we can continue with an increasing measure to supply. We, we may not have the right conditions. It may not be the right time. But we sow anyway. And, and we sow and we sow and we sow. And it continues to grow and to grow and to grow. And now we can thank God for it. Amen. I want to close with this in 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, verse number 10 through 15. In the J.B. Phillips paraphrase, J.B. Phillips put together some modern-day English translations of the New Testament, and I'll read this so you can follow along on the overheads if you like. 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, verse 10 through 15 in the J.B. Phillips. It says, He who gives the seed to the sower and turns that seed into bread to eat will give you the seed of generosity to sow, and for harvest, the satisfying bread of good deeds well done. The more you are enriched by God, the more the scope there will be for generous giving. And your gifts administered through us will mean that many will thank God. Everybody say, thank God. Thank God. For your giving does not end in meeting the wants of your fellow Christians. It also results in an overflowing tide of thanksgiving to God. Oh, I love that. An overflowing tide of thanksgiving to God. Moreover, your very giving proves the reality of your faith. I don't know if you got a hold of that right now, but you got to get a hold of that. Your very giving proves the reality of your faith. Why? Because we believe God at his word, and God is a good God, and God is a giving God. For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave. And therefore, if we believe our God and we believe his word, then we believe that he supplies seed to the sower. He will supply and multiply. And therefore, our giving proves the reality of our faith and means that men thank God that you practice the gospel that you profess to believe. Oh, my. We practice the gospel that we profess to believe in as well as for the actual gifts you make to them and to others. And yet further, as if that wasn't enough, yet further, men will pray for you and feel drawn to you because you have obviously received a generous measure of the grace of God. Now, last verse, verse 15. Thank God then. Everybody say, thank God. Thank God, thank God then for his indescribable generosity to you. In other words, we could focus on the seed. We could focus on the multiplication. We could focus on the fruit. We could focus on all that stuff. And yet he brings it back and says, thank God for the seed? No. For the bread? No. For the fruits? No. For the generosity? No. Thank God for his indescribable generosity where? To you. It all starts in the heart. It starts with God. It starts with us believing God and realizing that God supplies seed to the sower. You've got to be a sower first. God will give the generous heart an increasing measure to give. That it will never be a good time to give in the natural, but we're going to sow anyways. We're going to believe God at his word and sow anyways, and then that will result in us thanking God. If you got something from the word of the Lord today, come on, give God a great big praise. Woo! God is so good to us. He is so good. God is just awesome. Just awesome. Hey, everybody, remain seated during this time. I don't think I really need to say anything. You guys are ready. I can tell. Are we ready to bring our tithes and our offerings into the storehouse today? Amen. Now, there was a couple in our church, Fred and Robin. Would you just, Fred, just wave at everybody. Just wave. This is Fred Adams. Fred Adams is our administrator as well as the dean of our Bible college. And check out him and his wife Robin's testimony. Check out the overheads. The first week that we visited the Rock, we stayed. We've been here ever since, and that was um, almost 24 years ago. We captured the vision of, you know, Pastors Jim and Deborah as they shared plan for the new facility, Absolutely. and we knew that we wanted to be a significant part of it. We got on board. I think for us and for the people that were at the church at that time, it was a milestone. 
It yeah. literally was a turning point in a lot of our lives, Absolutely. which set the foundation for what we are experiencing today. God will definitely bless in, in more ways than you can imagine because he promises that the blessings will be greater than you can contain. To be a part of this campaign uh, is just like for us at the first campaign. We knew that it would be impactful. People come here for, with all types of situations, circumstances in their life. And the church is a place to where they can touch God, meet God, and have those needs met. And to know that you were a part of what made the provision for them, what made that happen for them. There's just no other, no greater satisfaction. Because we realize we're not giving to a church, we're giving to God. And then once we do that and it's out of our hands, it's not our responsibility anymore, it's God's. I think that what we're doing today, we're creating a legacy for tomorrow. Amen. I want to speak to everybody. I want to just thank you, first of all, for allowing me to speak that word into your lives. I know it's, a, it's sometimes a tough word, but it's a good, healthy, solid word, and I really do believe that you guys got something out of the word today. Thank you for that. God is good. Now, listen, it would be a tragedy if we came into the house of God like we did today and had such a good time in praise and worship, had such a good time in the word, and then you left this place and your heart wasn't right before God. You died and you went to hell and you didn't go to heaven. Now, sometimes people say, well, pastor, I don't believe in hell. You know what? I don't believe that a good God would send people to hell. Well, listen, you know the Bible talks about hell, Old and New Testament. Jesus even spoke of hell. You can find that in your Bible. It's a very real place. And just by burying your head in the sand and ignoring something doesn't make it go away. You've got to make sure that your heart is right with God and that you don't end up in hell. Listen, God's intent is not to send you to hell. No, you choose heaven or hell with your life here on the earth. So God is not mean-spirited. In fact, the Bible says that God is waiting to come back because he's unwilling that any should perish. God loves you so much and doesn't want you to go to hell. It was never designed for you and I. It was designed for the devil and his angels that rebelled. So let's make sure that your heart is right and that you don't end up in hell, but you go to heaven. Now, sometimes people say, well, that's cool because all roads lead to heaven and you hold to your truth. I've got my truth. I'll hold to it. And as long as we're true to ourselves, God sees that and he's going to let us into heaven. But the problem with that statement is Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means we can't get there your way, can't get there my way, can't get there some well-meaning church committee's way. There's one way we're going to get to heaven. And you can't just say all roads lead to heaven. No, there's one way to heaven, and that's God's way. Now, many times people hear that and they say, well, that's cool, that's good news because, you know, I've been a good person, done a lot of good things in my life. You know what? I I was raised in church. Parents told me we were Christians growing up, went to religious classes, wore religious jewelry, was baptized or christened as a child, and, and, and got involved in my church as I grew up, sang in the choir, taught in Bible classes, got a membership card, all that. You know what? I'm cool with God because I've done a lot of good in my life, raised in church and got involved. But the problem with that thing is, you know that nowhere in the Bible say you can be good enough to get into heaven? Like our works get us into heaven? No. In fact, when we compare our goodness and our good works with God's goodness, it's like filthy rags. It's not going to be able to stay. It's going to be thrown out. And the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So that means you're not going to make it on your own merit. Can't do enough good. Can't attend enough church. Can't go to enough classes. Can't get involved enough in church to get you into heaven. This is not about your good works. Because that's not going to make it. That is not the way to get to heaven. Today, I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it if that's how you think you're going to get into heaven. Now, sometimes people say, but you know what? Not only when I was a child did I sit in church. You know, I'm here in church right now, and, and and I'm always in church, and I consider myself to be a Christian. That's great. I'm glad you're here today, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, you're, you're here in church all the time. But you know that nowhere in the Bible does say church attendance gets you into heaven? Like you can sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. That'd be like me saying, I'm going to go down to Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles. I'm going to sit in the dugout, wear a Dodger uniform, bring my bat and my ball, call myself a Dodger and think that that's going to get me to play in the game. Nope, they're going to find me sitting there, drag me out and lock me up. Why? Because I'm not a Dodger. Can't just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Sometimes people say, but wait, 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 I know God. I know about Jesus. I know about Easter and the resurrection. Celebrate Christmas and sing the songs every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you. I know God. Doesn't that mean I'm a Christian? 
Well, no, it doesn't because if you'd read your Bible, you know the Bible records that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible records the devil himself knows who Jesus is. You can find that in your Bible. And you can find the devil quoting scriptures in your Bible, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a moment. This is not about what you have in your head, having mental assent towards God, knowing who he is in your head, but rather this is about your heart. Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born again if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I know that terminology turns a lot of people off, and they, they, they think back to a movie they saw or a book they read where some born-again weirdo screwed everything up, and they say, oh, I don't want to have any part of that. But listen, this is not about what society or books or movies or television say. This is about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean from the Bible? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. It's an all-or-nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you. In the last book of the Bible, book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, little out, a little up, little down, a little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance, God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why do I say look out? Because think of it. Only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today, I'm going to give you an opportunity just like this. I'm going to count to three and pop my hands together when I say three, just like this. Bang! When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that. Bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh Uh-huh. You might be. Get over that embarrassment. Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. But Jesus said these words. He said, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see your hand go up. Count it, you can put it right back down. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, better than going to hell. Jesus said, I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. But he also said, if you deny me, I will deny you. So hey, today, your call, your choice. I've done my job, loved you enough to tell you the truth. God's done his job sending Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. Now it's your turn. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? It's that simple in this safe and friendly place today. You can do it. Who should raise their hand in a moment? You've been running from God instead of to God. I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, today, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus by giving him all of your heart and all of your life? Come on, you can do that today. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can make a right relationship with God by simply acknowledging your need for Jesus in a moment by raising your hand. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together all across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching my television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online, you can lift your hand up right where you're at. Okay? Here we go all together on the count of three. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high. There's one. There's two. Thank you. There's three. God bless you. There's four, five, six. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? Six wise people up on top. Up on top. Anybody else? Six. Where are you at? Number seven, got you up there. Thank you. Number seven, number eight, got you down here. Anybody else real quick? Eight wise people already on this side. On this side, up on top. Nine, thank you. God bless you. Ten, got you right there. Thank you. Ten wise people. Eleven in the family room. Twelve in the family room. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? We got twelve. Thirteen up top. Got you up there. Thank you. Thank you, ushers. You guys are doing a great job. Anybody else real quick? We got about thirteen wise people. You know you need to give God all of your heart. You know you need to give God all of your life. Anybody else real quick? Is that a hand right there? Anybody else real quick? Come on. Just pop it up and wave it at me when I'm looking your direction. Anybody else? Anybody else real quick? You know you need to do this. If God's tucking out your heartstrings and you're sitting there wondering if you should do this, you should do this. Come on, go for it. We have about 12 or 13 wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else real quick? Come on. I already got you up there. Thank you, man. You're good. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? Real quick. All right. Let's give the Lord a hand for about a dozen wise people. Hallelujah. God is so good. Okay, let me give some instructions. First of all, for those of you online that raised your hand, 
click the button that says respond to God, the blue button right there, and someone will lead you into prayer. If you're in the foyer and you raised your hand, the Love Rock Cafe, tell an usher, or if you're within distance, you can just come into the church service. In a moment, we're all going to clap and give a shout. As we do, that's your cue. If you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand, to get your stuff, get your Bible, get a friend if you need a friend, get in the aisle and meet me up front, because we're going to change destinies today, but we can't do that until we get you down here. So if that's you, you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand, get your stuff, get a friend if you need a friend, get in the aisle, and you come right now. Just come on down. Come on down. Let's welcome them as they come. Come on, come on, come on. Quickly, get your stuff, get a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. From the family rooms, you can bring your children. Come on. You are welcome to bring them on down. They're still coming. Let's give them a hand. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Come on, come on, come on. They're still coming. Come on. There's room for you. You can come too. Come on down. All right, all right, all right. Praise God, praise God. If you need to come, I'm going to give some instructions. You just make your way down. Let's just let them come. Hey, everybody, look up here. Give give a big smile on your face, all right? This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. You came to give God all of your heart, came to give God all of your life. Now, right over here to my right, your left, this is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really good guy. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they going to be weird there? Listen, you already got past me. I'm about as weird as you're going to encounter today, okay? He's cool. Nothing weird is going to go on. He's going to do three things. Number one thing he's going to do, he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart, and you're going to be born again. Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free information, some free literature that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. It's easy reading, and it's free, and you need to get a hold of that. Third thing he's going to do, he's going to give you absolutely free a friend we have here in the church that we call a spiritual personal trainer or an SPT. You'll hear that terminology. You'll see that on signs and things like that. SPT or spiritual personal trainer is a friend in church who will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. He'll tell you about it. He'll introduce you to an SPT and then he'll let you come right back out. Okay. Now listen, listen, I'm going to make a promise to you guys. Give us one year of your life. Sow some time, sow some effort, sow some energy. And for the rest of your life, you are going to reap the blessings of God on your life. And you'll say, I didn't know it could be this good. Am I telling the truth, everybody? All right, so if you guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Come on, let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.